What a privilege it is to stand before this congregation and preach the gospel. This is my first sermon in Austin Alive Church. Not my first sermon, but the first one at Austin Alive. And uh, it's, a, it's a privilege, to, it's an honor to be here. The title of my sermon today is The Tale of Two Sons. Have anybody ever read the story, The Tale of Two Cities? All right, well, it's not that, okay? <laughs> and worry, I ain't preaching on that, but I am preaching on the tale of two sons. And uh, as, as, as usual, you know, two sons, they're individuals and, and they're different. But they got one thing in common, and we'll find that out as we get into the, the sermon a little more. They got one thing in common, and what they have in common is very, very important. I'm going to read scripture. Now, I don't normally read this much scripture at one time. As a matter of fact, that's, in all the sermons that I've preached, this is the first time that I have read this much sermon, uh, this much scripture right out from the beginning. But uh, I just feel to, to get the thing going the way I want it to come out is that it's going to be necessary to read all this scripture at one time. So bear with me as I read. Have y'all noticed, does any, any of us that are getting, you know, slightly older, have you noticed the print has gotten smaller? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. Now, as I read this scripture, you're going to recognize it. It's uh, Luke, chapter of Luke, the book of Luke, and it's chapter 15, and I'm going to start reading at 11. And I'm going to read down, I believe it's to 31, so it's, it's, a, it's, a little, it's a bit lengthy, but just stay with me, all right? Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Ring a bell with anybody? Just, just asking. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now, remember that as we go through this sermon today. Remember that statement. He says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they begin to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has, a, has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry. He's thinking about Jeremy right now. He's the older brother, isn't he? Just wonder if he ever got angry with Joseph. I'll ask him. <laughs> The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and have never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, he knows he didn't call him the brother. <laughs> he didn't say my brother. <laughs> he said, This son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes come home, 
You killed the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So now we got the tale of the two sons, right? We got this younger son who came to his father and he said, you know what, I, I'm tired. Of, and, and I'm going to read, y'all give me some liberty. I'm going to read between the lines a little bit. But he, you know, he basically came to his father and said, you know what, I've, I've had about enough of coming out here and going to work in the fields every day. And, you know, I'm, I'm the son and, and I'm the young son. I'm the baby of the family. And, you know, you're supposed to treat me a little better and, and all that. And, and uh, so I want my part of this state. Now, what he's saying is, He's actually showing quite a bit of disrespect to his father because what he's saying is, I don't want to wait for you to, you know, to die and pass on. Then, then get, I want it now. Now, Jewish law, the way it was set up, the oldest son received two shares of the estate. And then whatever was left, however many sons were left, they all got a share apiece. So in this case, there's two sons. So the oldest son was entitled under Jewish law to two-thirds of his father's estate, and the youngest son was entitled to one-third. So that's what he's asking for. I want one-third of all you, that you're worth. I want one-third. And we know this man was wealthy because he had hired servants, right? And the uh, father gave it to him. Pulled out whatever one-third of his value of his estate is. Here it is, son. And the Bible tells us that this first son... Actually, he's the second son because he's the younger. But anyway, first one in the story, okay? He goes to a distant country. You know, Pastor, I didn't realize this until I got to studying. He went to, you know why he went to a distant country? Because he wanted to go and enjoy some sinful lifestyles. He didn't want to be around the people that knew him. <laughs> he wanted to go hide. I'm going to go somewhere else, I'm gonna, and I'm going to enjoy life. But I want to get away from everybody that knows me because I don't want them to know that I'm living this kind of lifestyle. So he went off, and the Bible tells us that he squandered the money. What's the old saying the world says? He squandered it on wine, women, and song? Yeah, something like that. And I, and I can just see, I got this mental picture, see? I got this mental picture of him partying. What do they call it? Party hardy? And he's got lots of friends around there because, you know, he's got the money. And he's the guy that's, you know, come on up to the bar. I'm buying the drinks tonight. And, and hey, you know what? I, I got this. I got this. I got this. And he had all these people around him. Boy, they were just enjoying life with him. But then the money ran out. And all of a sudden, he looks around. And he's by himself. And he's not only by himself, but he's starving to death now. He has no money. He has nothing to eat. He has no means. And there he is. So he hires himself out as a servant. And you're talking about humiliation. You got to remember this is a Jew, okay? You know what he's doing? He's slopping the pigs. That is about the lowest humiliation that a Jew can suffer. Slopping the pigs. And as he's feeding the pigs, the Bible tells us that he looks at the food that the pigs are getting, says, man, I, I'm starving. I wouldn't mind eating some of that. But the Bible says they wouldn't even give him that. So he's starving to death. So he makes a plan. He comes to his senses, so to speak. You know, desperation will sometimes bring us to our senses, won't it? And he comes to his senses. He says, you know, I remember my father's servants. They did pretty well. My, you know, my father treats his servants pretty good. They got plenty to eat. Matter of fact, there's food left over. They got plenty. My father takes really good care of his servants. I think I'm going to go back. He said, you know what? I'm going to go back and I'm going to tell my father, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you. That's number one. And number two, I'm not worthy to be called your son anymore. I took advantage of you. I showed great disrespect to you. I sinned against you, and I'm not worthy to be called your son. 
And number three, just make me like one of your hired hands. I realize that I'm not worthy to be your son, so just make me like a hired hand. Just hire me. I'm just going to hire out to you. That's the one son. That's the tale of one son, right? But there's another son, isn't there, in this story? And the other son was the elder brother. He's the one that gets two-thirds of the estate when the father passes. And as usual, these brothers are, are opposite. And, and I tell you what, the whole time I've been preparing this sermon, I don't know why, Pastor, but I thought about Jeremy and Joseph, not because they've done any of these things, so don't get the wrong idea. <laughs> it's not because that. It's just because Joseph is, is, is the younger brother and Jeremy's the older brother, and, and, and there's just two of them, right? So every time I say, man, I can just see it, you know? So don't take, don't take nothing out of context, okay? <laughs> but the, the reason I say that is, Jeremy, for instance, has different talents than Joe, right? They're two different individuals. You take Jeremy, one of the best drummers I have ever, ever seen. And I, and I know a lot of drummers and musicians and so on and so forth. And that's just one thing. He's got more. That ain't all he does. I mean, you know. But see, Joe don't play the drums. Matter of fact, Joe has confessed to us that he don't play nothing. He don't sing nothing. <laughs> but he got his talents, doesn't he? Now, I'm just bringing that up to show you. There's two brothers here, and they're totally opposite, which is very common. So we got the older brother here. And from the scripture I read, we find that the older brother, I got to take his coat off. I mean, I know I look really good in it, but yeah, yeah thank you, brother. The older brother, we, we find from the scripture, he has been out in the fields working. I mean, he's doing everything that a son should do. He's getting up, alarm clock goes off, you know, he's getting up every morning. He's going to the field and working with the servants and, and he's working to better his father's estate. He's making it prosperous and he's working hard. And when his father tells him to do something, you know what he does? He does it. There you go. You know, he told his father, I've never disobeyed you or nothing. Father says, go to that field and clear it. He goes to that field and clears it. Go to that field and plant it. He goes to that field and plants it. No matter what the father told the oldest son, the oldest son did it. He was obedient to the father. He showed the proper respect to the father. Totally opposite from the younger brother. That's the tale of two sons. But you remember I told you they had something in common, right? So let's get back to the younger son. After he came to his senses, he comes in, he's headed back to the father, and the Bible tells us that the father spots him from afar off and runs to him. Now that just tells me, now the Bible doesn't tell us how long the son's been gone. We do know that he was gone long enough to squander a small fortune, or maybe a large fortune, I'm not sure which, but... But that tells me that the father has been praying for his son to return, longing for his son to return, looking. I can see the father going out on the front porch every now and again and just looking. Hey, wait, 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 who? No, no, that's not him. Oh, wait, no, no, it's not him either. But I can just kind of see him every day, maybe several times a day, go out and look. My son's going to come home. I just know my, Pastor, I just know my son's going to come home. And this particular day, he looks, and he looks way out, and he gets his attention. He's like, that's him. I know by the way he walks, that's him. And he runs to his son. And his son's got this speech all made up, Pastor came. And the Bible tells us that the father runs to the son, and he, and he hugs him. And then when he hugs him, and he kisses him, Amen. He just welcomes him back, you know. And the son got this speech all ready to go. He says, Father, I, I'm sorry. I, I sinned against you. I sinned against you. I sinned against heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be your son. And he was going to get to the third part, see, where he says, make me your hired hand. But he never got there. You know why? Because the father stopped him right there. 
called his servants, said, get the robe, get the ring, get the sandals. This, this, this boy needs sandals on his feet. He needs the ring. You know what the ring signifies? The ring signifies that he's still a son. <laughs> I like that. I'm telling you, I like that. He's still a son. So he never got to the third part because the father cut him off. He said, no, you are a son. And I'm going to tell you what's important about that. Because it don't matter how many mistakes we've made. Does anybody beside me make mistakes their whole life? Well, I've made them. I've made them. I've been like the prodigal son, all right? I've sinned against God. But you know what? When I come back to him, God is rejoicing just like the father did here. He wraps his arms around me, and I'm still a son. How about that? I'm still a son. This young man went out, squandered everything, wild, loose living, came back to the father, going to be satisfied with just being a hired hand. Father says, no. Put a ring on his finger. Put a robe around him. Put shoes on his feet. My son who was lost has now been found. My son who was dead is now alive. See, he's still a son. And that's really important for us to get that. You know, I was telling pastor before the service, as I studied and prepared for this sermon, I've been studying for it for months, I got about 12 sermons you can preach out of this, for real. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> but he's, this is what's important. It don't matter what we do. It don't matter how many times that we fail. We're still a son. We're still sons, we're still daughters. Just because we messed up. See, thank God that he is spirit and that he's God and he's not human flesh and blood like we are. Because if he was, he'd be vengeful and we wouldn't have opportunities to come back to him, would we? You ever see people say, no, you've done it. That's it. I'm done with you. I'm done with you. You get no more chances. You always got chances with God. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how many times you fail. You always got chances with God. When you come back to God, he wraps his arms around you. He kisses you on the neck, and he says, welcome home, son. Put this ring on your finger. Man, is that powerful or what? Yes to me. Yes to me. But see, the other son wasn't quite so overjoyed, was he? The oldest son was been out in the field working because he was that obedient son. He was like some Christians today that when people come back, they want, you know, people come, the people that's gotten away from God and they come back. This is sad, but some Christians, some well meaning Christians, all week, you know, he messed up. Now we're going to let him come back, but, but. <laughs> He, you know, he can't do nothing. He's going to have to sit back on the sidelines and he's going to have to prove himself. And, and if and he proves himself for a few years, Pastor, then we'll think about letting him maybe sing a special or, you know, lead a testimony service. And, and, and you know, if he's got the call on his life to preach, we'll, we'll finally, we'll, we'll get around to letting him preach a sermon, but we've got to wait. Well, thank God the Father's not that way. But the oldest son came in from the field and uh, he heard the music. He asked one of the servants, what's going on? He said, your brother has returned. Now, instead of being overjoyed that his brother has come, he got angry. And let me tell you what, he wasn't just angry with his brother either. He was also angry with his father. His father went out to get him. And, Son, why don't you come on in here? Your brother has, has, has come home. Your brother was lost, and, and now he's found. He was dead, and now he's alive, and he's back. And Come on in, and let's celebrate. And the oldest son says, no, I ain't celebrating. That bum went out and spent all the money, money we could have used to better this you know, estate, bloat it, had fun while I stayed here and worked, and you let him, and you gave it to him, you didn't stop him. You could have, you know. He was angry. You ever thought, why was he so angry? I think there was more than one reason. One, he stayed there and worked all the time. 
felt like he was overlooked. He said, hey, Pop, I've been here working hard for you. I've never disobeyed anything you've told me to do, and you never even killed as much as a goat for me. For him, you kill the fatted calf. Y'all know what the fatted calf is? I was raised on a farm. We would take the fatted calf. That's the calf you planted on slaughter, and you're going to raise this calf for beef. You don't just put him out in the field and forget about him. As the calf grows, gets a little closer to the age of where you need to slaughter him at, you start bringing him in. And he's not just eating grass anymore. He's getting grain. That's the fatted calf. We're getting him ready. He's getting grain. And in a month or two, I can't remember, it's been a long time, we start giving him corn. I mean, we're getting this thing ready. When we take this thing and he comes back to us wrapped up as sirloin steak and, <laughs> you know, stuff like that, it's going to be top-notch beef. That's the fatted calf, all right? And the eldest son says, you give him the fatted calf. You ain't giving me as much as a little goat. See, the goat, a little goat ain't worth near what that calf's worth. I'll tell you that right now. You hadn't even given me a goat to celebrate with my friends. He was angry. Felt like his father overlooked him. Felt like his father may have loved the younger brother more because he's doing more for him. And the father tells him, no, you got it all wrong. We're celebrating because he's back. He was lost, now he's found. Well, see, there was something else playing on in his mind. Remember, he's the oldest brother. He gets two-thirds of the share. That's all that's left. The younger brother done took the third, right? All that's left of the estate, the, there's two-thirds left, and it's going to go to the oldest son. He's worried. Oh, that baby brother of mine, he's come back, and now he wants part of my share, Pastor Cain. <laughs> he wasn't satisfied with taking his share and going out and spending it and, and wild living and having a great time and doing all these things. He went and bloated it. Now he's broke. And the only reason he came back because now he wants some of my share. We, we, we can get that way, can't we? But look at what the father told him. He said, my son, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. <laughs> the father took a little time there to reassure him. Don't worry about that. You're always with me. I know you're here. I appreciate the fact that you're here. And everything that I got is yours. He reassured him right there. I'm not taking nothing away from you. In other words, I'm not going to penalize you. I'm going to take care of you just like I said I would. I called this sermon the tale of two sons. We looked at two sons, they're brothers. They're completely different. You see different behaviors. You see different directions in their life. But see, they had one thing in common. Remember I told you that going in? And the one thing, they might have been different than everything else, but the one thing they had in common was the father. <laughs> they had the same father, didn't they? And I'm going to tell you something. This father loved them both equally. He didn't love the young son more than he did the elder. He loved them both. He loved them both the same. And that's important for us to remember that. Because see, sometimes we look at people and we feel like, well, God has blessed them so much and God hasn't blessed me like he's blessed them and God must love them more than, no, he don't. God does not love you more than he loves me. And he does not love me more than he loves you. I think about that quite often as I go through my life every day. And as I deal, you know, we're a service company where I work and deal with customers. And sometimes I just shake my head like, man, did these people die at birth or what? You know, <laughs> did your mama have any kids that lived? You know, that kind of thing. And it's like, I can't believe these people. And then I find myself, Lord, you, you, don't, you don't feel that way toward these people, do you? <laughs> I mean, I really find myself there, and, I, and that's when I have to repent and pray. And I, I say, Lord, 
help me to love like you love. Because see, when God looks on a person, what does the scripture say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, those who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It didn't say those that dress well God loves. He didn't say those that drive nice cars and live in nice houses God loves. He didn't say those that don't stand on the street corner and beg God loves. God loves everybody. He loves us all. Every human being that's ever been created has been created by God, and he loves us all. He's the father. We have, just like the two sons here, we have something in common today. We have the same father. We have the same father, and he loves us. He cares about us. And when we do fall, he runs to meet us when he sees us coming. And he throws his arms around us, and he hugs us, and he kisses us, and he welcomes us back. And he's overjoyed that we have come back in the right relationship with him. Praise God. I hope tonight, my prayer tonight about this sermon is that you got as much as I did. I don't know. I hope I presented it as well as I got it here because, I mean, I, I got it. And that's something that I think that preachers always a little concerned about, Pastor Kane. We get these sermons, God gives them to us, we study, we pray, we seek God, and we get it. And we just hope that we have presented it in a way that you can get it to. I appreciate this church. That, you know, tonight we, we have come a long ways together as a church. And we've had lots of good times as a church. We've had tough times as a church. And I appreciate this congregation. And I appreciate the opportunity to stand before you and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because see, like the prodigal son, if you go back and look at my past, Brother Cain, you would say, buddy, he's not worthy to preach the gospel. You know, he's, he's done some things that uh, wasn't so good, Pastor Avery. He sinned against God, and he's not worthy to be up here. But I'm made worthy by the blood of Jesus Christ, and I thank you for that. Pastor Avery, thank you for having me to speak tonight.